grace and peace to you in the name of our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. O oh, come, let us worship our God together on this Sunday, August 16th, 2020, the 20th Sunday of Ordinary Time. As we gather to worship, let us share in the call to worship. Rejoice, people of God. Celebrate the life within you and Christ's presence in your midst. Our eyes shall be opened. The present will have a new meaning and the future will be bright with hope. Rejoice, people of God. Bow your heads before the one who is our wisdom and our strength. We place ourselves before God we, that we may be touched and cleansed by the power of the Spirit. Come, let us worship the Lord. Please be called to confession with these words from 1 John 1. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Please join me in prayer. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. And now let us enter into a time of silence that we individually confess our sins before God. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Amen. For our children's sermon today, I'm going to read you a story, and I'm going to hold up the book because I think you can at least see our two characters in this book, and one is blue and one is yellow, and the name of this book is Who is My Neighbor? And now that you've seen what they look like, I want you to close your eyes and use your imagination to see this story. It's fun to have pictures, but it's also fun to trust our imaginations and see what a story looks like from inside our heads. So this is a, a new book for me, and I'm excited to share it with you. And when we are back in church together again, I like this book so much, I might read it to you again. And then you can see what the outside pictures look like. So who is my neighbor? Once there was a town where only the blues lived. There were navy and indigo and aqua and sapphire and powder blue and midnight blue. They planted irises and forget-me-nots and they feasted on blueberries and blue cheese. They sailed on blue waters. Blue jays were on their branches and brilliant blue cracker butterflies shimmered. The blues thought they were the coolest colors. The yellows lived in a different town. There were gold and bronze and lemon and marigold and mustard and canary and pale yellow. 
they planted sunflowers and daffodils and feasted on bananas and butterscotch pudding. They traveled on yellow brick roads, goldfinches perched on the branches, and busy yellow jackets buzzed. The yellows thought they were the hottest colors. The blues and the yellows did not like each other very much. The blues said, be careful of the yellows. We are better than they are. They are not our neighbors. They warned their children not to go near the others. Be careful of the blues. We are better than they are. They are not our neighbors. For years, the blues said there was no such thing as a good yellow. And the yellow said there was no such thing as a good blue. One day, Midnight Blue put on his best blue helmet and got on his blue bike. He loved cruising under the bright blue sky and passing by the tranquil blue lake singing a bluegrass tune. Then out of the blue, someone passed by so close that Midnight Blue lost his balance. Bump, thump, Midnight Blue tumbled to the ground. His knees started to turn black and blue. Midnight Blue needed help. Along came Navy Blue. Navy will help me, Midnight Blue thought, but Navy was afraid. She wondered, maybe somebody made Midnight Blue fall, and maybe that person is still around. So Navy pretended not to notice Midnight Blue. Midnight Blue was surprised. Why hadn't Navy stopped to help? After all, Navy was his neighbor. And then along came Powder Blue. Powder Blue will help me, Midnight Blue thought. But Powder Blue wondered, did Midnight Blue get in a fight? Is that other person still around? And he was afraid, so he pretended not to notice Midnight Blue. Midnight Blue was surprised. Why hadn't Powder Blue stopped either? After all, Powder Blue was his neighbor. He thought, neither Navy nor Powder Blue is true blue. Along came Lemon. Oh no, a yellow, thought Midnight Blue. A yellow will only make things worse. Maybe this yellow will steal my books. But Midnight Blue wasn't the only one who was scared. Lemon worried about helping a blue. What if that blue would trick her? What if that blue jumped up and took her bike? Maybe she should just hurry by. But Lemon didn't hurry by. She decided to help. She didn't steal his books. She picked them up. She lifted Midnight Blue from the dirt, handed him his blue helmet, and helped him get onto the back of her yellow bike. And then she took him to her doctor. While they waited, Lemon gave Midnight Blue a butterscotch cookie. It was broken, but still delicious. Midnight Blue said, you're a good yellow, not like the others. Most yellows are good, said Lemon. So are most blues, Midnight Blue said, and he smiled. And he pulled out a small bag of blueberries and gave some to Lemon. They were a little squished, but still yummy. When Dr. Gold came out, Midnight Blue was still a bit frightened. Dr. Gold was another yellow. But Dr. Gold smiled at him. She shined a light into his eyes, checked to make sure nothing was broken, and put a bandage on each knee. Midnight Blue turned to Lemon and said, thank you for helping me. I would like to be your friend. Lemon nodded, of course, a good friend. When Midnight Blue returned to his town, he told all the blues about what had happened. It was not at all what they expected to hear. He said, Lemon did not pass by. Lemon did not look the other way. Lemon helped. And Dr. Gold did, too. The blues thought, the yellows do not look like us or eat the same foods, but maybe the yellows can be our friends. When Lemon returned to her town, she told all the yellows what had happened. 
it was not at all what they expected to hear. She said, Midnight Blue wasn't mean at all. He was thankful. He shared his blueberries, so sweet. And from now on, we're going to be friends. And the yellows thought, the blues do not know our songs or grow our plants, but maybe we can help the blues, and the blues can help us. From that time on, the blues and the yellows began to say, maybe we don't have to look alike or even live nearby. Perhaps we will like hearing new songs and tasting new foods. We might like making new friends. Maybe we can all help one another. Maybe, said Midnight Blue. Lemon smiled. Maybe, just maybe. The end. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for our friends and neighbors. A lot of them we've met this week as we've picked up from the storm. We thank you that you challenge us to open our eyes and see and talk to neighbors we don't expect to see and talk to. We thank you for Jesus who calls us to love all our neighbors, especially the ones who aren't anything like us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare to hear the, the God's word, would you pray the prayer of illumination with me? Lord God, good shepherd, by the leading of your Holy Spirit, help us to listen for your, your word and follow in your paths all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our morning Old Testament lesson is from the 133rd Psalm. Listen for the word of God. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred, when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard. On the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessings, life forever. Amen. Amen. Our New Testament lesson this morning is from Matthew 15, verses 21 to 28. Listen for the word of God. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. Jesus answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think it's really surprising that this story in Matthew's gospel survived the writing of Matthew's gospel. It's not a story that shows Jesus in a very good light, or the disciples for that matter, where is the compassion? Where is the desire for healing? 
Where is the striving to show the love of God? Where is the Jesus that we're used to learning about? Jesus has entered a non-Jewish region that's north of the Sea of Galilee. And not surprisingly, the news of his ability to heal people of all illnesses has spread to that region as well. So as he and the disciples are passing through Tyre and Sidon, a woman of that region, a Canaanite woman who clearly has heard about him, comes chasing after them and calling out to them because her daughter is ill and she wants Jesus to heal her. And she's so persistent that Matthew records that the disciples said to Jesus, just tell her to be quiet and go away because she's bothering us. She's yelling too much. Just, just make her go away. And then Jesus, Jesus that we think we know, says the most appalling thing. He says to her, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. God has not sent me to you and your people. If I helped you and your daughter, it would be like I was taking food out of the mouths of God's people and throwing it to the ground so the dogs could eat it. You are no better than a dog trying to steal what isn't even yours. And if that wasn't enough, as if that wasn't enough, Jesus was using a common racial slur of his day. It's like Jesus was using the N-word with this woman. Because Jews referred to Gentiles, to those who weren't Jewish, as dogs. And you don't need a history lesson from me to know that this was truly an insult that Jesus was saying to this woman. We're seeing and we're hearing Jesus speak and act like someone from his culture, someone raised in that culture. But we don't expect that of Jesus, do we? What does it mean that Jesus uses a common racial slur in the face of a woman who's asking for help? What would prompt Jesus, the Jesus we think we know, to say no to a woman who's trying to get help for her daughter that she loves? Why in the world is this story in Matthew's gospel? And how can we find any good news in this story when Jesus is so hard to recognize in this story. As I wrestled with this story this week and tried to figure it out and did some reading, I was reminded of a movie I saw years ago in which someone's surprising words changed a person's life. And it's a story that I actually told you years ago, but some good stories just need to be told again. And the story comes from a movie that's called Music Within. And our Friday night movie group watched it this year. And I want to warn you in advance, if you go looking for this movie and watch it, it is rated R because it does a very good job of using the language of the day. <laughs> so the language is rough in this movie. But the story is amazing. It's the true story of a man named Richard Pimentel. And he is an author and an advocate for employers who are working with people with disabilities. He's someone that works for disability rights. When the Americans with Disabilities Act was enacted in 1990, Pimentel was very instrumental in it being written and in then it passing. Now, he initially became interested in the ways that those with disabilities were treated because of his own story. He was a Vietnam veteran, and the bunker he was in was bombed, and he lost most of his hearing. He could no longer hear any of the upper registers of sound, and he could hear vowel sounds when people spoke, but not the consonants at the beginnings and the endings of words. And on top of that, he had tinnitus, which for him was a constant high-pitched ringing sound in his ears. And so he quickly learned how to read lips as his way of communicating. Coming home from Vietnam after being injured, he went to the Army Rehab Officer to get signed up for the GI Bill so he could go to college. 
And this man told him no, that he wouldn't approve his application. He said, I won't approve it not only because you're deaf, but you are worse than deaf. He told him that he would spend his whole life being confused, he would amount to nothing, and that he should just quit before he started. And he wasn't going to waste the government's money on someone like Richard Pimentel. Through his own disabilities, and then the disabilities of friends who were also coming home from Vietnam, Pimentel found his life changing pretty quickly. And then he finally was allowed to attend at Portland State University, and there he met Art Honeyman. And Art was a man who was confined to a wheelchair because he had cerebral palsy. They met in the cafeteria at Portland State University, and he already knew about Art because Art was kind of a fixture on the campus. People knew him as the man who was in the wheelchair. They knew him as a man because of the way he spoke. No one could understand him. His cerebral palsy made him a very obvious part of the Portland State campus. And Richard knew before he ever met him that no one could understand what this man said. And in fact, many people kind of thought he might be a bit deranged. The very first time he talked to Art, Art was fighting the movements of his body, the spasticity of his body, to open a can of Coke. And Richard went up to him and said, I see that you have a Coke problem. And then he opened the can of Coke and he set it down in front of Art and he said immediately, don't talk to me. No one can understand you. I read lips. I'm deaf. I can't understand you. I can't read your lips. If I read those lips, I would get seasick and throw up. Not a very auspicious beginning for a friendship. And so Richard began to walk away and then he writes later, the most marvelous thing happened. Art grabbed me and he started talking to me. Now, no one could understand Art. He makes all these high-pitched noises, these strange noises with his speech. So there's speech going on and the strange high-pitched noises because of his cerebral palsy. But Richard writes, guess what those strange noises were? They were above my hearing range. So the only thing that I could hear from Art Honeyman was what Art Honeyman was actually saying, because they were in a lower register and I could hear the words. And so a real friendship began. Richard continues this story and he says that there was an event that changed his life forever. One day, Art had a birthday and his sister sent him $10. And he called Richard at 3 a.m. and he said, hey Richard, I got 10 bucks, pancakes. And Pimentel writes, when you're around 21 years old and someone calls you at 3 in the morning for pancakes, it sounds like a good idea. So they went. And they went to the place they normally went, the pancake house. But that night, there was a waitress who had never seen them there before when Richard would cut up and feed Art his pancakes. Richard said if the usual waitress had been there, it wouldn't have been a problem. But he said, but this was the woman who was meant to be there and to change my life. He says, she's the only woman to change my life without alimony. He continues, she came up to Art and I thought she wanted us to order, but she said the meanest stuff I ever heard anyone say to Art. She turned to him and she said, you're the most disgusting looking person I've ever seen in my life. I can't believe that someone as ugly as you would come to a place where people are trying to eat. I won't serve you. I don't even know if you're a human being. I thought people like you were supposed to die at birth. Richard writes, I had never heard anyone talk to art like this before. He says, this was a man whose IQ was above my cholesterol level and he had a sharp sense of humor. So he turned to me and he said, Richard, why is she talking to you like that? Then she said that we would have to leave or she would call the police. And we said, call them. And then we got arrested. The police came and they said, if you don't leave, we're going to put you in jail. And Art said, I want to go to jail and Richard wants to go to jail too. 
They were placed in a holding cell overnight, and in the morning they were fed breakfast, and you guessed it, it was pancakes. And then they were accused of breaking an ugly law. And Richard explains that this was a law that started in Chicago in the days of P.T. Barnum and Company. And when they were in town, people wanted the freaks in the freak show to stay at the freak show. They didn't want them to come into town and get a burger, he writes. So they passed laws that if you were improper or a disgusting object, you could not be out on the public streets. We were, he says, found guilty. And we came out of the courthouse and Art looked up at me and smiled. And I asked him, why are you smiling? And Art said, we got pancakes and I've still got the 10 bucks. He concludes, we decided to change the law. I went from a silent observer of disability apartheid to an intolerant observer of disability apartheid. The result of this experience was that Richard wrote a training manual for employers about how to work with those with disabilities. It was called Tilting at Windmill Windmills. It was the first training manual ever written for employers. And after writing it, and after it became implemented, he was later hired by the government, and he became a trainer for the CIA, and for NASA, and for the FBI, and many other government agencies. And later, I read in 2008, as our veterans began to return from Iraq and Afghanistan, he developed new employer training to support that transition of wounded and disabled veterans living with PTSD and traumatic brain injuries and amputations. So when he first wrote Tilting at Windmills, he had his first draft and he gave it to Art and he asked Art to read it. And he said, if it's not any good, I will just throw it away. And there's a wonderful scene you'll see if you watch the movie when Art has finished reading and Richard comes into the room to see what he thinks of this training manual. And Art asks him, why did you want me to read this? And Richard says, because I don't know what I'm doing, Art, but I would never have written this if I hadn't met you. And Art responds, you don't have a clue how good this is. You know what we cripples want, to be seen. When they look at me, no one sees me. They see nothing. I'm ignored. He gestured to his crippled body with cerebral palsy, and he says, how can you ignore this? But they ignore me because I am so disturbing to their definition of human. What you've created will make them see me. The Canaanite woman wanted to be seen and heard. Seen and heard not as a Gentile dog, not as a hysterical screaming woman bothering disciples. She wanted to be seen and heard not as a pagan non-Jewish woman undeserving of Jesus' care and attention. She wanted to be seen and heard as a woman who loved her daughter. She wanted to be seen as a mother looking for help for her daughter. She wanted to be seen as a woman who believed that Jesus was a healer sent from God. In this short few verses, in this short story, she uses the word Lord three times as she addresses Jesus. She wanted to be seen and heard as a believer who believed that Jesus had the power to heal her daughter, and she wouldn't take no for an answer. Like the waitress in the pancake house who changed Pimentel's life forever, this Canaanite woman changed Jesus' thinking forever. She challenged his racial prejudices that were based on what he'd heard from everyone that was around him where he grew up. She challenged his belief that Jews were more loved by God. She challenged even his understanding of his own mission 
on earth. She spoke up. And in speaking up, in being heard and seen for who she was, a child of God, she changed, she changed Jesus' mind and she changed Jesus' heart. And Jesus said to her, woman, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you wish. And instantly, her daughter was cured. I think it's important to note that the very last words that we hear Jesus speaking at the end of Matthew's gospel are these. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This week, I've been thinking about why this story was kept in the New Testament. What does it mean for us that Jesus basically uses a phrase like the N-word to speak to that woman? He was just as offensive as that waitress in the pancake house. What does it mean for us that Jesus was challenged about his racial beliefs and his biases. He was challenged about his religious beliefs and biases about who are children of God. And he was challenged about his own understanding about his mission here on earth and his ministry. What does it mean for us that Jesus changed his mind? Maybe the story is in the Bible exactly because it's so unexpected and so surprising. Maybe this story is meant to be our Canaanite woman, our waitress at the pancake house that forces us to make some changes in our lives. If even Jesus could be challenged in his racial prejudices and his understanding of who God loves and who is a child of God, if even Jesus could be challenged about the direction his life was going, then what about us? If even Jesus could be challenged to change this much, then are there places in our lives where we're holding on to old beliefs that we heard for years in the places where we grew up? Do we need to be challenged in our racial prejudices, in our understandings of who God loves or doesn't love, in the direction that God wants us to take in our lives and in our ministries? If even Jesus could be challenged to change, then what about us?
In our announcements this morning, I remind you that Laura Brown and I are at the end of the phone. If you are in need of pastoral care, a listening ear, someone to pray with you, please don't hesitate to call us. As I've offered in other writings, I am welcome to set up a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting. If you would like to have some time to talk and to pray together almost in person, please don't hesitate to give me a call and I can set up a Zoom meeting. Speaking of Zoom, a reminder that at 11 o'clock each Sunday, we gather for a Sunday gathering by Zoom. Last Sunday, there were about 30 of us gathered together, and I hope more of you will join us. It's a wonderful time to pass the peace of Christ to each other, to share joys and concerns and pray together, and then to just talk together and hear the news of people's lives and meet people's cats and dogs as they wander by and see people's art and living rooms and backyards. So please consider joining us. An invitation for that has already been sent out this week. A reminder as well that we are struggling with internet here at the church. We are getting closer to an answer, but there are times our phones also go down with this problem. So please use my cell phone number. If you need to reach us here at the church, don't hesitate to call my cell and we will get this fixed. It just may take a little longer, especially given the storms of this week. If there's something that's happened with the storms and you need help, we have people who are runners, especially if you lost food and need to restock. Remember, we have people that will do shopping for you. Just call the church office and we will get that signed up. As we come to our prayer, please let us remember to keep in our prayers all those who are affected by the storms that have hit a good chunk of this part of the Midwest and as well to remember to keep in our prayers the people of Beirut, Lebanon, as they continue to recover from the devastation of the explosion there. For our prayer today, we will be praying the prayer that's in your bulletins that comes from the Feasting on the Word Worship Companion. Let us pray. Let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Lord, help us. We trust in you. God of mercy and healing, you are Lord of all, embracing the estranged, blessing the banished, reconciling the rejected. We cry out to you now, confident that your provision is abundantly more than enough to preserve the church, redeem the world, and deliver the tormented. Lord, help us. We trust in you. For your people, the household of faith near and far, Lord, help us, we trust in you. That the church may replicate your reconciliation, model your mercy, and herald your healing for all, Lord, help us, we trust in you. For unity, and harmony to flow freely among your creatures and throughout your creation. Lord, help us, we trust in you. For reconciliation and new beginnings among estranged families, races, nations, and peoples. Lord, help us, we trust in you. For healing for those who are tormented rejected, marginalized, fearful, forgotten, cast off, living with chronic illness, battling cancer, living with loneliness. Lord, help us. We trust in you. For those whose names we now lift into your presence in this time of silence, hear our prayers. Lord, help us, we trust in you. For our ancestors in the faith, now kept in your care and never forgotten by you, Lord, help us, we trust in you. We stand in your circle of favor, embraced by you, healed by you, blessed by you, remembered by you, 
secured by you, grateful for your loving care that we see in Jesus, in whose name we now pray together the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Notre Père qui est aux cieux, que ton nom soit sanctifié, que ton règne vienne, que ta volonté soit faite sur la terre comme au ciel. Donne-nous aujourd'hui notre pain de ce jour, Pardonne-nous nos offenses, comme nous pardonnons aussi à ceux qui nous ont offensés. Et ne nous soumets pas à la tentation, mais délivre-nous du mal, car c'est à toi qu'appartiennent le règne, la puissance et la gloire pour les siècles des siècles. Amen. And now as we come to the end of this time of worship, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May our God look upon you with favor and give you peace. And the children of God responded, Amen.